which is at the University of Washington. Uh, we take great inspiration from what the Simpson Center has been able to do. And they've been around for much longer, and if you go to their website, you'll see basically a million different ways that they are fostering uh, public humanities scholarship. So we get a little snapshot of their amazing achievements today with these four speakers. The first speaker is Jason Groves. He'll be talking about, um, on the topic of exposed, public environmental humanities. Jason is an assistant professor of Germanics. His monograph, The Geological Unconscious, German Literature and the Mineral Imaginary, is forthcoming from Fordham University Press in the spring. From 2015 to 2016, he was an urban fellow at Exploratorium, Museum of Science, Art, and Human Perception. And for the last few years, he's co-organized the cross-disciplinary research cluster on the Anthropocene at U of Washington Simpson Center. He co-edits the blog, Feedback, which is hosted by Open Humanities Press. The second speaker is Lee Mercer. Uh, she'll be speaking about Hispanic film programming and the film festival phenomenon. Lee is an associate professor of Spanish and comparative literature, cinema, and media. Her research focuses on the modern and contemporary Spanish novel, Hispanic urbanism, tourism, and silent film. She's the author of Urbanism and Urbanity, the Spanish bourgeois novel and contemporary customs, published by Bucknell. And she's currently at work on a book project on technological display and technophobia in Spain's earliest cinema. These two faculty presenters will be followed by two doctoral student presenters. The first, oh, wait a sec, you got your PhD, didn't you? <laughs> 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 Slipped in under the wire. <laughs> okay, so Dr. Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> scholarship, activist poetics in the time of social media. Uh, C.R. Grimmer, who also goes by Chelsea Grimmer and uses she, her, and they, them pronouns interchangeably, is a poet, scholar, and lecturer. They are the host, producer, and creator of the poetry vlog, have poems in journals such as Poetry Magazine, Fence Magazine, and Hank, and have published articles in journals such as The Comparatist, Comparatives. Recently, they completed their PhD in literature and cultural studies and were an Andrew Mellon Foundation fellow. Their book, O Ezekiel, is forthcoming for Gasher Journal and Press. And our fourth speaker is Isaac Rivera. He'll be speaking on digitizing the sacred water, struggle, and the digital geographies of the Orochete Sekulini. How did I do? He said that means the Sioux, uh, right? The Great Sioux Nation. The Great Sioux Nation, for those of you who didn't get it from my great accent there. That is what that means. All right. Isaac is a PhD student in the Department of Geography. He's a research assistant at the Relational Poverty Network, and he's a council member at the Fourth World Center for the Study of Indigenous Law and Politics. His research and teaching interests include digital geographies, feminist political geography, critical cartography and GIS, racial capitalism, settler colonialism, politics of knowledge production, social movements, and environmental justice. So you basically can ask him about anything. <laughs> All right, he conducts research projects ranging from indigenous self-determination struggles in Nicaragua, India, Ghana, and at Oshiti Sakuri to questions of environmental injustice and development in his hometown, Denver. His current research asks what the counter map looks like in the digital age, how digital mediation produces practices of digital enclosure and digital territorialization that remediate and reiterate settler state power across time and space, and how indigenous nations resist so please join me in welcoming our four speakers. Okay, so our first up is Chase. Uh, 
conceptualization or the stage of actualization of my um, of my class <laughs> called exposed public environmental humanities um, it's a graduate seminar uh, which will explore what are the public environmental humanities I have some uh, misgivings about that name which if I have time at the end of my talk I'll say a little bit about if not any questions that could come up um, but it's basically starting with exposed there's a lot of work for me I'll talk about that for a few minutes and then move on to the talk so developing this course um, exposing students to public environmental humanities, participatory environmental humanities from across the humanities division at my institution. Um, basically, environmental humanities um, scholarship with uh, the environmental justice component. Um, I'm really interested in this figure of exposed and exposure from Stacey Alamo's work. Maybe some of you know that, um, uh, which takes the exposed subject, in her words, always already penetrated by substances and forces that can never be accounted for as a starting point for environmental humanities rather than the masculinized invulnerable body. Um, I'm also interested in exposing uh, public environmental humanities um, for a lot of its colonial legacies um, in environmental studies, in environmental conservation, and in eco-criticism. That's some of the work of exposing that I want this class to do. And really starting from this point of exposure, um, this starting point that Stacey Lamble writes about in her book, Exposed, um, I want to invite students to put themselves out there, um, to have classes in public spaces that are determined by student research interests, encouraging research methods um, that have a product beyond a scholarly essay, um, forging connections within and without the university. We have a lot of really great institutions in Seattle and on the university uh, campus, which I won't go into, but can talk a little bit more about. Um, uh, oh. um, some of the models that I have for this class are sort of micro-production, sort of plug-and-play models of other f uh, alternative forms of public scholarship, um, like the field guide to neglected or overlooked environments, um, walking labs, uh, walks are really important um, uh, thing that I think people might be really interested in. Reading groups like Ecofeminist Fridays are at the University of Melbourne. They have public read-ins as a refuge for critical um, ecological feminist thought. Um, salons for generating new uh, vocabularies for a time of climate breakdown. That's the work of the Bureau of Linguistical Reality. It's these kinds of projects that I will be that we'll be looking at and reading in class, and we're going to be developing our own projects around. A few words about how I got to this. This is like the record scratch. How did I get here? This is. Um, I went on a lot of walks, honestly. This was something, and something that's interesting about the, the research for this, for this class and for my, for my scholarly interest here, too, is that it was originally things I just considered to be extracurricular. But slowly, I've been thinking about how these actually could inform the curriculum. This was a walk that the eco-artist Buster Simpson led um, for this group that was mentioned on the Anthropocene Cross Disciplinary Research Cluster, where his chalk talks were, um, he sketched out on the former Alaskan Way viaduct um, um, columns uh, uh, in blue in blue in blue chalk uh, projected to sea level uh, uh, sea level rise as a, as a function of climate change, um, and yeah, I just want to reemphasize that that was a lot had to do with extracurricular work. I'm in a I'm in a Germanics department. I'm in a language and literature department, and so I've been spending a lot of time thinking about how these kinds of projects could inform my uh, curricular design, particularly in graduate education. Um, I did a lot of, I also had this position at the Exploratory Museum as, a, as an urban fellow for a year, and that was just a great time to listen to other, uh, to a whole other range of scientists and artists and activists who were doing a lot of work 
around, um, around the environment, around climate change, and then at some point also to produce some of my own essays with, in partnership with the museum for different audiences and different publics. Um, originally when I thought of this class, it was going to be divided up into three areas, publishing, collecting, and performing and organizing. I was interested in other, other scholarly outputs like blogs, lexicons, manifestos, earthworks, um, in terms of collecting archives, libraries, film series, museums, and performing and organizing. I was really interested in facilitated walks, um, the work of the walking lab I mentioned. That's um, Stephanie Springate and Sarah Truman, her at University of Toronto. Um, really collaborative, um, collaborative, uh, collaborative walking tours. Um, guided tours, protests. But this summer, I was at Association for the Study of Nature and the Environment, and um, um, Alison Kruth, who's at the UCLA, um, had this really amazing workshop on incubating public environmental humanities projects using speculative, um, speculative projects. So within the span of about two hours, a number of graduate student instructors and faculty um, were able to devise some really interesting projects. Uh, in the span of two and a half hours, thinking through all the different aspects of a project. And for my, for this class, I think I would actually be interested, really interested in doing something like this, working together collaboratively in the class on um, speculative projects where then individual students can go out and maybe realize an individual component that's maybe tied to their own uh, research interests, the list of what they have to do, and stuff like that. Um, Um, thinking a little bit through the how and the process of this, I mean, it was curricular development, didn't feel like the right word, maybe extracurricular development was really the right word. This was from um, an event with Smudge Studio, uh, who organized uh, a, a micro-production, as they call it, around recalibrating one's senses to um, Earth magnitude. They pour these really awesome teacups, which are at the tilt spin of the Earth. And they held these events, which brought a number of people just from the university, but from the different parts of the university, to come and talk about challenges faced in the Anthropocene. Finally, I think in my last like minute or so, um, <laughs> I wanted to just think a little bit about, although exposure is the starting point, how people are exposed differently. Uh, this was another tour that uh, we did with the Anthropocene Research Cluster, and then again with undergraduate students with the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition and James Rasmussen of the Duwamish. And um, this very day that we passed, which is ama actually an amazing restoration site, if I tell to the camera this way, you would see some really amazing restoration work done, but it's also a site in Seattle where you have things like crushed car barges, which this same day that we were there, I don't have the right slide, um, caught on fire. And the entire car barge caught on fire and polluted sent this acrid smoke into the atmosphere in what is already the area in the state which has like the highest asthma rates already. And so in closing, I want to think about, rethink, on the one hand, my interest, which I kind of started with about, um, as a grad student course, professional, professionalizing public engagement, marketization as well, with these other realities on the ground and thinking about ways in which this course can also help to dismantle the authority of public of the institutions of the university through public scholarship. Thank you. agencies and the 
private sector. So in designing a new graduate seminar for this new cohort of uh, PhD students, but also master's students, I wanted to honor the fact that faculty in area studies and language departments are increasingly asked to organize film series, even though PhD programs rarely prepare graduate students for such endeavors. And secondly, I wanted to, or I envisioned, that this type of cultural labor is precisely the type of experience that would be of value to our PhD students outside of academia. Since film festival organization offers students training in programming and curation, design, budgeting, marketing, and educational outreach. And lastly, I saw how I might engage graduate students that took this seminar in some of the pedagogical questions that had been plaguing my own undergraduate Hispanic film courses, i.e. how to improve uh, studies, film studies knowledge, uh, and create, I guess, an understanding of the very rich Hispanic audiovisual landscape among Washington State high school students before they got to me, right? Before they got to the University of Washington. So I designed a syllabus with a really daunting list of learning objectives. <laughs> One, I wanted my students to gain a historical awareness of the film festival as a phenomenon. Two, I wanted them to understand the critical <coughs> implications of programming choices. What does it mean to select and screen one film and prioritize one film over another? Three, develop a basic knowledge of the film festival circuit in Spain, Latin America, and in the Latino world within the United States. Uh, and they were going to do that by interacting with programmers and film festival directors in Seattle and abroad. <coughs> and here you can see some of the partner organizations that we worked with both in Seattle, Mexico, and in Spain. And this is my a small group segment of my uh, my cohort of students from uh, last year. Four, I wanted them to experience a sampling of some of the strongest performing festival films from Latin America, Spain, and the Latino US since 2000, and develop the necessary critical tools for film analysis through our discussion of those films. Five, I wanted them to carry out a Hispanic short film programming workshop under the guidance of programmers at the Seattle International Film Festival in order to begin making and defending curatorial choices. So we dedicated almost two weeks to that workshop. And most importantly, it was the real kicker, <laughs> I wanted them to work in small groups outside of class over the length of our 10-week quarter to, to develop a thematically based two-day film festival for Latino students, but also for Spanish language students, learning students, at a Seattle high school. This would constitute the student's final project for the course and would include a defense of their chosen theme, a selection of four films, marketing materials, pre-festival pedagogical activities, and a festival program with additional information on workshops, Q&As, and other activities to occur during the festival. So in their curatorial groups, students championed the idea of film as a framework that has the ability to show us ourselves. And they highlighted the negative aspect, especially for many of my Latino students, of, uh, that ethnic minorities feel when they do not see their subjectivity represented in the media. Other students of mine argued in these curatorial groups for the equal importance of raising the profile of Hispanic cultural contributions among the Anglo-Spanish language learners of Seattle, especially given who's in the White House right now, but also the dramatic recent demographic shifts in Washington State. So we've gone from being about 7% Hispanic to about 15% Hispanic in the last 10 years. <clears throat> so, um, that Hispanic community is still all too marginalized from political and social power in our state, despite those sweeping demographic changes. So through the conversations that emerged from these groups, students proposed two distinct festivals, one around the theme of outsiders who became agents of change, and the other around, focused around the theme of diversifying our understanding of Hispanic identity. With judging help from the director of the Seattle Latino Film Festival, and also our high school teacher partners, we chose to move forward with the theme of outsider heroes. 
the opportunity came to stage the festival at Chief Self High School in Seattle, in South Seattle. It came about after I connected with the head of the Seattle Public Schools World Languages Office and a very, very enthusiastic Spanish teacher at Chief Self High School. He basically became our advocate and he championed the festival uh, theme in his classroom over the course of many months. So his guidance of my students on their multiple visits to Chief Self ahead of the film festival would not, right, nothing that my students could have brought to the film festival would have had a willing audience were it not for this particular teacher. Chief Self was the perfect venue for piloting our film festival. Uh, it is a unique high school within Seattle. It is 29% Latino. It is one of only two international baccalaureate high schools in the city and offers a dual language immersion program. So some five weeks after our 10 weeks together, right, in the winter quarter of last year, 2018, on Cinco de Mayo, on the 5th, 5th of May, uh, we ran our pilot festival at Chief Self High School uh, on a Friday afternoon. And this is what our crowd looked like. Um, we screened two films on the first day and ran Q&A sessions for about 300 students. Uh, having already engaged with these students in pre-festival classroom activities and experiences during the previous two weeks. And on Saturday, the second day of our festival, we workshopped the basics of film studies knowledge, right? Cinematography, mise-en-scene, etc., with a smaller cohort of students in the intermission between the next two films that we screened that day. At the end of our work together, graduate students turned in individual narratives reflecting on their own learning process through the course. So here I'm going to end by employing those narratives to give my students the final word on our work together. One student argued that what they had most learned from our seminar is that cinema has the power to guide young people who find themselves in a world of infinite online choice but with little culture of how to find meaningful experience. Another student remarked that a turning point in the seminar for them had been a Skype conversation that we'd had with Mike Hostage, who is the uh, deputy director of the Sitges Film Festival that you saw up, uh, there on the screen. It's a fantasy and horror film festival in Spain, uh, who when they asked him how his festival was planning to connect with teenagers, poised to become their core demographic, right, in the next iteration of the festival, he didn't just talk about the need to employ new technologies and tactics to cater to their customs, but he instead confidently stated that they would have to simply inclinar su mirada, which means to train their gaze. Thus convincing this student of the role of festivals in educating the public and raising standards. Still another commented that the final course project allowed him to develop some measure of leadership skills, engage in respectful dialogue, network with cultural workers outside of academia, abilities which the writing for him of a traditional research paper could have never fostered. Lastly, one student summarized the value of this type of training and its impact on her professional future. Quote, as the humanities in general struggle to fight for funding and recognition, Public scholarship is one of the ways our departments can prove their importance by making tangible links to the people that surround us and providing educational opportunities to the public while tuning into that public and serving the needs voiced by those community members themselves. She said, whether I end up teaching at a high school, a college, or working in another field, I predict that at least once and likely more often in my career, I will fall back on what I have learned in this class whether it be in organizing a film festival or another act of public scholarship. Thank you so much. more important than to talk about the project because it provided a space for collaborating and learning from different scholars at different levels mm -hmm. and who are from different disciplines. Um, this QR code should work. If you don't know how QR codes work, you open your phone and point it at it. Mm -hmm. And in theory, you get a link at the top of your phone that you then open. 
if you're not a QR code person or you're like me and don't like to pull your phone out in these types of settings, you can just type in the poetryblog.com forward slash poetry blog and it will take you there as well. So it's pretty simple. Um, so this is this is my project, the poetry vlog, V L O G, not vlog, not vlog. And uh, you, again, there's the hub at the poetryblog.com, we're on social media, and you can find my contact info down there. So an overview. First of all, it is a teaching YouTube channel and podcast. It's dedicated to building social justice coalitions through bringing together cultural studies, literature, and related arts dialogues. Um, this is important as well because people think of poetry as a niche print culture, but it does best and it consistently expands into other arts cultures. Um, so that's part of it. Seasons one and two um, aired during the academic year of 2018 to 2019, so last year, as kind of an individual effort and kind of learning the ropes of it. Season three is airing technically now, um, weekly episodes, and then this summer provided a space and a break from teaching to kind of develop the materials at the Census Center. And then there's also some support from the Jack Straw Cultural Center to help with the audio development. Um, so that's kind of the, the backbone of it. Um, these are some of the students, not all of them, were also helping with season three, and I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. Okay, so oftentimes when I talk about this project, I jump right into the logistics of the project itself, and I think I end up kind of skipping over what brought the project into being. Um, and a lot of it stems personally from my interdisciplinary background as both a poet and a scholar, somebody who's never felt totally at home in a literature department or a cultural studies department, and really seeing all of these seemingly siloed conversations as actually being a lot of dialogue with each other and then unintentionally or intentionally excluding community actors who are also having these conversations. So the first intervention is very much building on cultural studies in the US, specifically Barbara Christian, for instance, in the 1980s made what's considered in a lot of gender and race studies departments in the US a seminal argument that art is not an object to be studied and neither are the artists, but they're actually lived and engaged modes of theory. Um, and I believe this as well. So it's like, how can we act on that instead of writing on that all the time, right? Uh, so kind of a simple intervention, but a really important one to me. Um, the next one is maybe more obvious. It's bringing together public and digital communities. I didn't know it was digital communities until I was told it was digital <laughs> communities. I was just like, these are tools that the public sees, like that's that. <laughs> but very importantly, I didn't want to just archive or just kind of track. I wanted to have a community-based participatory style of the research. So if my research is on contemporary poetry from living poets and pop artists, then I need to interact with them and bring them into the classroom in a way that doesn't reduce their labor to just that visit in the classroom. Um, and then the idea too is what free tools that already exist and that I can like YouTube how to use can be kind of recruited for this purpose so that it's not dependent on like the funding of a particular academic platform. And then of course having it not be exclusively available at an academic setting. So hence YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. Um, young folks know how to use it. I didn't know this, <laughs> even though I'm young, and uh, podcasting. So then the literary analysis is kind of the secret intervention. So it's modeling close reading, right? We do close readings. It's also thinking about how literary research doesn't have to be contained in the university setting, right? These are living artists and authors. So how can we bring them into our research and merge our analysis and our interventions with their analysis and their interventions? Um, and then the other sidebar is just there's a ton of how-to videos on YouTube for STEM discipline students and social sciences. And as a teacher, I've taught a lot of institutions, there aren't a lot for literary studies, which I think indicates we're not exactly a how-to discipline. But that also means that there's a lot of room for creating in this particular genre and mode. So I wanted to get those materials developed for myself and for other teachers. And then finally, it's interdisciplinary mixed method, which I didn't realize until I had to articulate it. Because again, if you're an artist scholar, you're already interdisciplinary in mixed method. Arts-based research depends on working with other disciplines. Mixed method just means you kind of cobble together different approaches, such as close reading and participatory research to create something new. Uh, and I wanted to build on poetry's doubled readership to do that, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, which brings together the arts with the humanities but then also bring in scholars who maybe don't identify in the arts and humanities. So it kind of tracks in a lot of different areas. And the primary demographic are actually not humanities folks, which has been really interesting to me. Um, at all, actually. 
Um, so overview of seasons one and two and kind of what happened the first time. There were a lot of different guests, such as the Nationally Poet Laureates, who were my favorite guests personally, um, and then some scholars like Sarah Dowling, who's actually from Canada, Toronto. Um, there were 55 videos, 150 podcast episodes because there's also daily readings that year, not like 150 interviews. A monthly newsletter, um, a website, which you could have QR code or now looked up, um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, because I was like, well, I have to do that. Um, that's, those two seasons got around 6,250-ish views and then around 23,000-ish listens, which kind of shocked me because this was before my work at the Simpson Center with it and I wasn't teaching them in my classes yet. So I was like, clearly there's like a need for this type of work. Um, this will not play because I decided to skip doing any video. But this would be an example episode, which we'll just say this is kind of the aesthetic that the first seasons were. And if we played it, you'd see, and you can find in the YouTube archive, a dramatic difference in quality. Um, and so this also makes it useful for teaching, because I actually teach the old episodes with new ones, and we talk about the differences and the rhetorical choices. Um, so you can kind of look at that on your own time, should you so desire. So some changes for season three. Um, there were a lot of guests I interviewed at AWP, which is the American Writers something but it's the thing that all the creative writers of the U.S. go to. Um, so it's got some more name brandish poets, which has been a kind of an interesting experience for me. I don't feel totally at home in the poetry world. But then there's also more students who will be on it. So if you are kind of familiar with the poetry world, some of those are Chen Chen and Tommy Pico. Um, a lot more Asian American representation and indigenous American representation. Um, there are only 25 videos and will be airing weekly. And then I have seven, we're calling them research assistants because I asked them to name themselves if they desire that they're doing independent study credits to kind of learn what I learned last year instead of learning it the hard way. Mm -hmm. And then we produce them together, which is maybe the best part of the project right now. And then we still have all these other pieces going. The a goal here is to eventually transition and it stays in a teaching model into a buy for students work. So the students will be producing their own videos by, or whatever mode they desire by the end of their credit. And they also have a huge voice in the content because if the primary demographic which I can talk about if you want um, later, is mostly broad-based audience, oftentimes undergrad level, then they're going to help me develop content that's responsive to a broad-based undergrad level. So it just kind of made sense. Um, we're not going to play the video, but this is an improved quality. <laughs> um, with S.J. Sindhu, who is actually one of my favorite experiences. We're not going to play the video, but this is the website. Um, it, it was a video, this screen capture, but when you go to the poetry log and go down, we're creating an archive. That's a new part of season three. So the different seasons are archived as like streams, but we're going to also create an archive by the end of the year of topics. So queer poets, queer color poets, indigenous poetry, like, and have them be categorized for teachers to use, as well as the podcast. I'm pretty happy about that. Um, so archive pages. And then this is just kind of an update on how the social media looks. And I know it seems silly, but a big part of it has been creating a cohesive brand that is not highly academic in its aesthetic and helps folks feel welcome into the living room. If that makes sense. That's part of why I thought I'd bring that into here. It's also had a pretty big impact on who I reach. So while I'll talk with other faculty, they'll be like, oh, do you have a video on this? I might use it. Like Maria Lane did that the other day. Um, scholar at our department, sorry. <laughs> um, with students or people who aren't in university, they actually stumble across this, and mostly actually in flyover states in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. I get like a lot of people signing up for the newsletter and reaching out, which in the U.S. has said a lot politically. Mm -hmm. I feel really good about that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if I can just not play with the videos. And there's print materials, which I can talk about another time. And that's the kind of final transition of what we're looking for. I got asked the other day about season four. <laughs> so <laughs> season four is hopefully forthcoming. Um, but the goal is to work with students and teach them how to write grants, actually, this next quarter. So I've written a lot of grants, I still have profit with. And we're going to reapply for some different funding sources to pay different collaborators. That's okay. working with the Colorado American Indian Movement. Um, so what I'm going to do today is explain my really long title here, called Digitizing the Sacred, Water Struggle, and the Political Digital Geographies of the Ocheta Shakori. Um, so in short, um, 
what this project is trying to do is to provide an analysis of understanding our contemporary moment. Our contemporary moment that's still uh, enmeshed in iterations of dispossession that are mediated by the internet of things in what I call the geoweb. So um, I am a geographer, so please forgive me um, in how I approach this. So this is not particular <laughs> to geography. I do believe that geography does help us better understand um, our world and does push the humanities um, to center um, what has been dispossessed. Um, so I want to take us to the struggle at Ocheta Shakoe with uh, Standing Rock. Um, so here I have maps. Uh, maps have been used for dispossession. Maps have also been used to visualize what has been dispossessed. And this is coming out of a tradition of countermapping which is uh, utilized in short to make the invisible visible. Um, and so this is basically a short, small little counter map of kind of explaining what happened at what happened at Standing Rock. Um, and so I have the Fort Laramie treaties, um, the treaties that were instrumental to how the, the American Indian movement and others have asserted as their territorial sovereignty, juxtaposed with their with their treaties here, pipelines. But this is, of course, just the beginning of this pipeline struggle, uh, centuries of dispossession. And so my my question um, in trying to understand this like mediated moment is, is how does the geoweb, the Internet of Things, in a sense, enmeshed in logics of settler colonialism and racial capitalism? mediate settler territoriality and digital enclosure across time and space. Now I believe in order to get at this question is that we need a different genealogy of how we approach such knowledge. Um, so I want to get into the situating of, of my project, situating the geoweb and racial capitalism. And we could even just even have situating the digital humanities um, within this analytic as well, and so to kind of organize uh, my thinking, so much of knowledge has been framed under 19th century enlightenment that comes from the doctrine of discovery before that, ha that has framed or current moment, past, and future. And so what I'm trying to, to do here with, with racial capitalism is, is to introduce a different genealogy of thinking about that, because given given the Enlightenment thinking, such as John Locke, the Adam Smiths, um, Rousseau, um, and, and so forth, those logics continue on to our contemporary moment. And so what the critique of political economy does by racial capitalism is that it helps us think about different ways of understanding these moments, in particular history. History is absolutely essential here. What the racial capitalism did, especially in conversations with the black radical tradition, was a rejection of Eurocentric models of history. Um, Franz Fanon um, and others, for example. Um, and to what that does in, in conversation with racial capitalism, and more into black thought, black power, red power, is to foreground something different, something beyond critique something that foregrounds an existence, presence, in both the past, present, and future, given these ongoing dispossessions. And so what I want to do now is just kind of take a moment of silence and have you all kind of look at some of these images. So what I'm trying to do here and argue is that this conjunctural moment of Standing Rock at Dapple wasn't just about maps, per se. Through the internet, through platforms, mediated images of landscapes, bodies, and maps were distorted, were abstracted, quite violently. Um, and I think there's something there that we need to 
keep pushing further, given the ongoing criminalization of indigenous peoples, including <coughs> the district here, uh, Red Fawn, who's of the Colorado American Indian Movement, in which I come from. And so what I did, um, thanks to the Simpson Center this summer, was to go to the very place, to the very source of knowledge, um, to understand these histories. I went to the Black Hills. Um, I went to the elders. Um, Regina Brave here is a direct descendant of the original signers of the Fort Laramie Treaty. Elder Phyllis Young um, sat with me in, in making a digital story map um, to put, basically convey these histories together for indigenous peoples to come together and, and think about these, these mediated moments that produce a particular violence. So digitizing the sacred, for me, we need to understand what digitizing does. It's another form of capture, it's another form of abstraction, another form of violence that is imposed on indigenous bodies, lands that foreclose future possibilities. And with that, thank you. <laughs> inspiring talks. I know uh, our speakers are happy to answer questions, so I'd like to invite the speakers to come up, and uh, I'll, I'll moderate, I guess. legibility and illegibility and how how resistance or change uh, so can you say more about that yeah so the so the, the platform that I, I, I in a sense built in a sense in conversation with the elders was a story map it's uh, it's uh, the, the intent of it is to basically bring in the humanities into a platform um, to basically kind of describe Area. And so all I did with what the elder was basically just kind of get her own narration of the four thermi trees to basically give the mic back at the the forebears of that history. That makes me want, if I may follow up, that makes me want to understand maybe more what you mean when you say digitizing the sacred time. Like it sounds like it's more than just yeah. on a digital platform, but Yeah, and that's in itself the project. Um, that, 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 is, that, is, that is the project, um, and, and to me, it begins with a different genealogy. It demands that. Um, it demands that given just the tensions of, and histories of cartography, of, of the map, and, and what that is, um, and, and bringing it into, okay, so this isn't just about um, the, the digital world, in a sense. These have material implications. Um, there's there's certain violences um, imposed on on how we read and how we read these these images even is largely is greatly situated based on our place. To, to some folks, the, the, these are really violent um, images, um, and so and so this project is just the beginning of, of what I'm hoping a, a longer a, a much longer project. Thank you. 
this, this is going to sound like a very conservative question, and it's not. <laughs> so I, I'm, well, I was just telling my colleague um, here, I, I, as a representative of a slightly uh, now, now unfortunately older generation of scholars, I feel like I just want to get the hell out of the way and let you guys do this because it's amazing. But I, my question is, though, I mean, I'm also developing a, a graduate center on environmental humanities, and I'm one of the things that sort of when, when we were working on the forms to submit it, they were like, well, what method of evaluation are you, are you using? And how, are you, how are you integrating this with the expectations and protocols and stuff that exist for a very traditional platform, precisely the kind of platforms of evaluation and, and dissemination that you guys are critiquing as the foundation of what you're doing? So I'm just, I want to know anecdotally from you how you're how working with graduate students in particular, um, or as a graduate student, how that, that negotiation has been taking place. And I asked for absolutely pragmatic reasons, because I want to do that too. <laughs> I, um, I'm not a faculty, I'm just a lecturer, so I only teach undergrads, so my response will be limited to that scope, maybe, That's which isn't necessarily the goal. But um, at our institution, we actually have multimodal composition and multimodal writing as an alternative to our traditional research writing classes. So we spent several, a couple of years actually, talking about how do you evaluate it using the framework of the original class moorings. So for instance, like if you're analyzing the way an argument is done in an essay, then learning how it needs to be adapted to a different mode gives you the same tools for giving feedback mm -hmm. and, and kind of analyzing it, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Whereas I found in graduate settings, people seem much more concerned with like, impact actually is a word that gets floated around a lot, so how many people received it and responded in what way, mm -hmm. which might need to be reworked if that's not the case. Um, but, so there seems to be two tensions in like how I've seen the evaluation sustained, but primarily, where they seem to overlap in a positive way, and I could be wrong, the faculty here could correct me, is that there is this sense that you can actually create similar analytic frameworks and just resituate them for the tools that are being used, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I spent a fair amount of time talking to right, project-based sort of final assignments yeah. as I was offering my graduate students are very common in other fields, not right. just not so much in the humanities, yeah, exactly. right, traditionally. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time learning from colleagues and asking colleagues, right, so how do you create a rubric for assessing right. this type of project-based yeah. uh, work and learning from them? Um, and I think that's something we need to do more in the but humanities, yeah, no, right, is to reach out to colleagues in other fields where that practice is right, sort of commonplace. I think from like the, the student end, and I think a big institutional gap, especially in trying to do like public work, that takes a lot of time and relationship building. Relationship building is, is instrumental to anything that the university um, does, especially with graduate students. There could be a lot of pressure to on graduate students, like, okay, um, get thrown into that extractive model that isn't that isn't productive. How, how do we build and sustain these relationships beyond the, the academia and into really sustain that public engagement? I mean, I could think of that being a useful thing to think of tenure. I mean, Absolutely. And, and promotion. Um, uh, that notion of relationships and networking. Um, I could probably echo a few points. Sure. Um, also, this course that I proposed is. Uh, on it yet, so I can't say what that will look like. But a few things is that um, I've experienced also doing project-based work with undergraduates using like a team-based learning pedagogy. Um, so I feel quite confident and familiar with that model uh, in terms of undergraduate education. Um, I'm probably just gonna run this class under an existing course number, so I have a kind of a false flag, which yeah. allows me to get around we do it all the time. these yeah. questions. Um, I would be, really be interested in revisiting that, though, and actually having a dedicated class um, for more visibility. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, and you know, actually in the car right up here, I think was it, I, my colleague Denise, maybe we were talking about this, precisely around, oh, around uh, impact. And the ways was it that University of Michigan is was yeah. reevaluating? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I just read story. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> talk to my colleagues here at the Simpson Center about okay. things which, um, at least for uh, for faculty on the tenure track, are able to get recognition, acknowledgement.
Can I just continue on this in fact thing? Because um, here in Canada, we have two provinces in Ontario and Alberta that are increasingly tying post-secondary funding to um, outcomes associated with student work. Um, so you're not going to get funded if your students are in jobs, um, which is uh, uh, dangerous for uh, some of us mm -hmm. who believe in a more rural model of education. Mm -hmm. And so there are scholars in um, some of those provinces who are trying to come up to speak the language of the um, bureaucrats, to come up with impact measures, to be able to say things like, oh, turns out I'm doing digital humanities, turns out I'm doing mixed media, here are my numbers, to, to, to speak the language of the people who hold the purse strings, but to use that in, um, in purpose of, of, of continuing the existence of the co-op. Co-opting that language mm -hmm. for, for a positive mm -hmm. outcome. So I guess, I don't know, is that, some, is that, a, is that a strategic move that is valuable for the public humanities to make, or is that a move that is something that we should resist because it's in opposition to the very thing that we do? Should we, should we talk about impact, or should we use it more? It's funny this is our conversation because this is all we talked about. Just a week ago, this is what we talked about too. Yeah. Um, that was a yeah. At the risk of talking too much, I have a point. Oh, yes. Oh, I just want to actually ventriloquize Kareem. Yeah. And you introduced me too. Yeah. Yeah who actually prefers the word contribution mm -hmm. to impact. And I really, mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's Karine's important Fez what words is, we use here. Kareem Tufez is the, the director of the new um, unit called Knowledge Exchange at UBC. Mm -hmm. And it's all about uh, creating conversations, sharing, collaborating, getting research mobilized in, in different locations. So contribution is a nice uh, shift away from impact. But you wouldn't believe how vocabulary paralyzes people trying to do interdisciplinary uh, or community collaborative work, because we all have very niche vocabularies that don't always serve us well. I just don't enjoy impact because it's top down, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. the whole learning process for me in this project was that these are my partners, right, beyond my little silo, mm -hmm. to take your word, and um, I'm tuning into their needs and they're expressing, right, what, what's going to serve the high school audience, right? It's not me telling them what I think they need to know about Spanish or Latin American or Latin film but rather than saying, this, these are the conversations I'm already having in the classroom with my students. This is how a film festival could augment the conversations that I, as a you know, high school teacher, am already having with them. This is what you can bring to the table for us. We had discussed. Absolutely. I'm sorry, I would just add that the Vancouver International Film Festival is dying to collaborate with the um, Humanities Club. I met with one of the uh, staff there who describes himself as a collaboration slut. So <laughs> I wanted to work with him right away. Um, so I have a spreadsheet that I have decided is, is a list of people who work on film in, at UBC. And um, if you're not on my radar, I'd love to hear from you and put you in touch with, we'll have some, we'll have some meeting events so that we can do something like what we need. It's been very generative. I now know two other faculty at the University of Washington who have taught film festival, right, sort of course, courses of this not exact nature, but working in partnership with many of the festivals, right, uh, locally and uh, somewhat, some of them with K through 12 education as well. Yeah. Just very briefly, we on the card we discussed being impacted as a metric as well to counter that uh, that hierarchical uh, nature of impact as just maintaining the cultural authority. Of the it's, we wouldn't pass it. <laughs> the funders wouldn't take that. But, but that is just a real metric. Yes, I would think. If you frame it as like it's reciprocal community engagement in order to expand like the knowledge that you can produce as well as the knowledge you can receive, there are ways you can 
I mean, I'm using that strong style. But I think like we underestimate the power we have with our kind of um, flexibility in how we use language in the humanities to reframe things. Like to me, like I have no plan of any of these videos going viral. They're not designed to go viral. I know what creates a viral video by accident. <laughs> <laughs> they will not go viral, and I'm happy with that. And I know when I'm assessing students or colleagues, that being impacted piece translates perfectly fine in the foster school business or other places, maybe in a dangerous, disturbing way sometimes. But nevertheless, I think that there is a kind of understandness to the fact that like, to, to be like a real like, life student or teacher, you have to learn how to be malleable and kind of develop new ways of approaching things. Um, Sorry, that was a <laughs> emphatic response. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, back on the I'm just remembering that there's alcohol next door. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so